Hey all, Ron K. Armstrong, filmmaker extraordinaire, and today I want to talk to you about the just released trailer for Blade Runner 2049. Now this looks like a green band trailer, which means it's approved for all audiences. Um, hopefully they'll release a red band trailer, which is usually shown in the theaters, has additional footage or explicit footage. So this one again is just a teaser, and we don't see much, but we do uh, pick up some things. Like for example, we know that Ryan Gosling is playing his new Blade Runner. And in the trailer, he's walking up to this old building and he walks inside, he plays the piano and out comes Harrison Ford, AKA Deckard holding his infamous gun. They exchange dialogue, talking about replicants. And uh, I guess uh, Ryan Gosling needs his help. And there's this big secret that's supposed to be revealed. And I have a theory on that and we can talk about that. But the thing I'm concerned about is I didn't, you know, basically Ridley Scott is not directing this. He's busy with Alien Covenant. And the original one, uh, which was released back, I believe, in June of 82, was awesome. You know, if you look at the visual effects, the music, the way they created Los Angeles in the future, it, it was just phenomenal. And, you know, I hope they bring that same look and feel to this new one. And I know Ridley Scott, he was very instrumental in doing that. I mean, if you look at his film, like Blade Runner, Gladiator, he, he really has a sense of creating a new and different world that we've never seen before. And that's important for Blade Runner, you know? So um, this new Blade Runner 2049 is slated for release, I believe in October, 2017. So they're probably still shooting in post-production. So between now and then, we're gonna get a lot of additional trailers. They'll give us more insight. And hopefully we'll see more of that future world and what's going on there. Uh, one thing to note is like Anna D. Armands, Armanas, she is playing Joy. Um, you don't see her in the trailer, and she's an actress who did a really great job with Dogs of War. I don't know if you saw her in that film. She was, uh, not Dogs of War, I'm sorry, War Dogs. She did a really great job in that film. I also, you know, I thought the film was okay. But the main thing to note who's going to be in this film, Blade Runner 2049, is my man Jared Leto, who played the Joker, and he did an awesome job, you know. So I'm really looking forward to see you know, what he's going to do in this film because he's a type of actor like Heath Ledger. He gets into his roles. So if he's playing a, a, a bad guy, I think you're going to have like the most awesome bad guy, especially in this whole Blade Runner world. So I don't know if you're familiar with the, the original story because um, the film dates back uh, so far is that, you know, it takes place in the future and you have these off-world replicants or what we call as AI, artificial intelligences or androids who have an expiration date. They only live for a certain period of time. In the film, they travel to Earth to find Tyrell. He's the head of the Tyrell Corporation. He created them to see if they can get gen uh, genetically modified so they can live longer. And Deckard, who's a Blade Runner or let's say bounty hunter, is assigned to go and retire him or kill them all. You know, And along the way, he meets this character, Rachel, who I think is the niece of Tyrell and finds out that she's a replicant, but she doesn't know that she's a replicant. And that's very interesting, they have this kind of love affair. But you know, on the side note, let me say this real briefly that, you know, I did file a lawsuit in regards to this uh, movie on a serious note, and it's been ongoing. So I'm, I'm bringing it back up again. Hopefully the judge will, will um, side with me and this can proceed. Because, you know, not many people know that Blade Runner is really based on my life story. It is, you know, and uh, originally they approached me. They, they thought that, you know, hey, they, they said, you know, you have an extraordinary life, Ron. And back then I went by Deckard, you know, the whole deal. So, you know, I said, OK, you can do this film. And then, you know, Ridley and I had discussions and we talked about casting. Originally, I was going to be played by, was it Dustin Hoffman? I didn't like that. Then Tommy Lee Jones. I was like, eh. Then finally, Harrison Ford, who's you know hot at the time, I said, sure, Harrison can play me, you know. But then they went off on these all these creative liberties. It just went crazy. Like for example, in the movie, they had me like after Rachel. I was never into Rachel. I knew she was a replicant. I wasn't like into that. But you know, the real relationship happened between me and Pris. Pris was you know she was chasing me. And, you know, honestly, the girl wanted some sexual chocolate, you know. But anyway, she she you know the reason she was doing all those flips was trying to impress me and show how flexible she was. And I just told her, listen, you know, I wasn't 
feeling you that way. I told her, honestly, I got a job to do. I got to retire you. Let's get this done and move on so I can have dinner, you know. But, um, you know, I stayed firm. And then after her and I slept together, next morning I shot her, you know. But um, I figured, you know, she's a pleasure model. I got to use her. I just don't, why throw a good thing away? You know, you can use her one last time. And, um, you know, and the way they portrayed her in the film, it's like she's this really smart girl. She goes, I think, Sebastian, therefore I am. Let me tell you something. I gave her that line. It was polo talk. It's from that Latin philosopher, Rene Descartes. And I told her that. Didn't know it ended up in the film and make her look like, oh, she's beautiful and intelligent and she can do gymnastics. No, Pris is not intelligent at all, believe me. And then, you know, the ending I was a little bit upset about. They made it seem like Roy kicked my ass, left me on the rooftop. Let me tell you something. Roy... The real Roy could not fight. I kicked his butt, left him on the rooftop because I felt sad for him. I knew he was going to expire, so it started to rain. I said, let me get out of here, leave this, this guy here. He's going to die anyway, and that's it. But suddenly in the story, he got twisted around where he's beating me up and all this crap. But anyway, we'll let, we'll let this settle out and this dispute go to court, and we'll see what happens. Especially I want to know like, how they're going to treat my character in Blade Runner 2049, because there's still more to the story, and I'm not going to talk about it because I don't want to get plagiarized again. But you know what their cover story is, right? Like Blade Runner is based on the story. Um, it's called um, Do Androids Dream of Electric or Electronic Sheep? You know, and that's by Philip Dick. So, you know... Psh- in fact, Blade Runner itself, the name Blade Runner, has, was nothing to do with that story. In fact, it was taken um, from another story that dealt with um, the underworld of, what is it, an underworld of, like, of, of mark, uh, black market medical services. And it was by Alan Norris, I think it was, back in 1974. So it, this whole thing has a long history going back, and it's kind of like a hodgepodge of different elements that, that created the whole Blade Runner thing. And one of the important things to note that really left a lot of audiences guessing. I think this should be cleared up. And, and I think Ridley Scott has, he's very strong in his opinion of this, is that Deckard is a replicant. You know what I mean? And I love that idea. I think they should have explored it more in a movie, but they did, I believe, an extended cut because Edward James almost brings, you know, there's this whole or, or, or origami thing and a whole Japanese origami thing in the whole film. So Edward James almost brings Deckard or leaves behind a unicorn. And Deckard has these dreams of unicorns which means that those memories are implanted, you know, because, you know, Edward James almost, Edward James almost his character um, goes to Terrell Corporation and retrieves the files and knows that Deckard has these dreams of um, unicorns because he's a replicant. The same way that um, Rachel had dreams of a little, or, or remembered herself being a little girl, but they were the niece of, of Terrell and they, and they weren't actually her memory. So it's a little a little complicated there, but, you know, I hope they explore that idea because, you know, this is, this whole Blade Runner thing to me is a grand metaphor for um, what the plight of, uh, what's going on with a lot of African Americans or minorities who aren't seen as having equal rights, who aren't seen as humans. So this whole thing about Blade Runner is like, what makes you human? You know, is it basically because you're created or is it because you think, therefore you are, you know, you know, so there's a lot of layers to that, that I think the film can explore. And then again, it's the, the motif of the replicant uh, fighting for rights, um, fighting to prove that they're just as human and they have a right to live, you know? And I think Roy's character at the very end talked about how he said, all these memories we lost, you know, and I, and I, I think it was a beautiful moment. So a couple of things I want to, um, didn't mean to get all deep and emotional with you there. A couple of things I want to talk about, too, that are, really need to be called out is Villegas' music. He's a Greek composer. Villegas is just awesomeness. If you watch the original Blade Runner, one of the things you're gonna, that's going to captivate you is the music, you know. And Villegas does a lot of films. He did Gladiator. He did um, Chariots of Fire. I don't know if you guys remember Chariots of Fire where they're running on the beach and they won all these Academy Awards. And it was great. Actually, I was in that scene when they were running on the beach, but I, I couldn't keep up. And so they never caught me on camera. And so um, I never made it to the final film. I mean, you try running on the beach barefooted. It, the sand is hot. It's all over the damn place. And it's very hard to get traction. All right. So um, he did Gladiator. And he also did Cosmos, the, the old Cosmos, you know, the original Cosmos. That music is awesome. I always love that music. So Villegas is like this 
kick butt composer. If I ever got an opportunity, I would love for him to work with me on a film. I think he would do a phenomenal job at that. You know, um, let's look forward to um, checking out some more trailers for Blade Runner 2049. And then um, we'll basically see, you know, also an interesting note too, I got an opportunity to actually see in person the building, the Tyrell Corporation building, that model. And I got a chance to touch it and it was awesome. I mean, the details that they put behind it, and this was recently, and I was surprised at how it held up through time. You know, I, I thought it would be falling apart or it wasn't in existence anymore, but it's still around. So we'll see what they do with that. Um, but anyway, that's just a side note. So let's look forward to seeing more of Blade Runner 2049, 2049 in the upcoming trailers that they're going to release. And hopefully it'll, it'll stay true to the original Blade Runner. And this is Rod Armstrong, filmmaker, and that's all for now.